Good evening, Mr. Perez. My... Oh. We'll edit that out later. I, I trust that you're hearing me from London. My name is David Jacobs. Are you hearing me in Jerusalem? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. May, I, may I welcome you to this very first teleconference? I think there's ever been staged in a hall in London and a studio in Jerusalem. The audience here is very eager to put questions to you. Uh, it's a full house at the Friends House here in the centre of London, just opposite from Euston Station. And I'm just going to introduce you, if I may, to the, the chairman of the Zionist Federation, Dr. Stephen Roth. Mr. Prime Minister, I hope you will forgive me if I make this introduction very brief. It would be presumptuous for me to try to introduce you to an audience of British Zionists. In any event, we want to save every minute of precious satellite time to hear you, to speak to us, and to answer questions. I really only want to thank you that in the midst of a very busy schedule, you found time to come to this teleconference to devote an hour to us. And I also want to express thanks now that you are about to hand over the reins of office to your successor for the wonderful way in which you led the affairs of the State of Israel, the people of Israel, during the last two years for your infatigable search for peace, for having, as a result, improved the image of Israel in the world tremendously, and last but not least, for having forged closer and better links between Israel and this country. Since the video link works only one way, and you can hear us but not see us, let me explain that we are meeting here in one of the larger halls of London with an audience of some 500 people, which includes both communal leadership and rank and file, and a good contingent of Zionist Jews, members of parliament, and members of the European Parliament, <coughs> and members of the House of Lords. And we are all assembled here to listen to you. And we thank you also for having agreed to answer later questions which will be posed to you. Mr. Prime Minister, we are all eager to listen to you. Perez, just before the questions are put to you by the audience here in Friends House, we would like you to speak to us uh, for as long as you choose. <laughs> Prime Minister, can you actually hear me now? Are you hearing me? Are you hearing us in Jerusalem? Prime Minister, do you hear us at all? Well. We, we, we did say we might have some problems. I would be very grateful if when Jerusalem gets the sound back, they will uh, tell the Prime Minister. I hear that the producer over there well, but he hears you very, very little. 
I think, are they giving you, can the Prime Minister be given a headset? That would clearly seem to be the answer, a hearing piece. I do apologize to you here. There isn't anything that I can do about this. And I, and I imagine that I will see by the Prime Minister's look on, in his eyes when he hears me. But I think that he can't hear me now. I can hear you now. Ah, good. Prime Minister, we are delighted that you can hear me. Did you hear the introduction from Dr. Roth? He said such charming things about you. Thank you very much. I can imagine and I appreciate it very much. I didn't hear it exactly. <laughs> well, one of the great things about this evening is it does prove that it can be very intimate and warm between all of us in, over such a large area of space. What we would like you to do is to speak to us before you take questions from our audience here in London. So the airtime is yours. Sir. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's now raining in Jerusalem. Actually, we're having the first train introducing autumn, putting an end to a very lovely summer, a little bit dry. We're short of water. And rain, in a way, is both a blessing and a hope. So our mood is up. Tomorrow, all of us will go to the synagogue to pray for Rosh Hashanah for a new year. Many of us will make some heart searching. I think generally the sum up will be rather positive. We have had two good years. Economically, we had a brilliant success. We got rid of inflation, almost. We have improved our balance of payment. It will be this year practically without any deficit. We have improved our exports. Our currency is strong. If previously the shekel was running after the dollar, now the dollar is running after the shekel. Unemployment is relatively low. And we feel that the ground is prepared for a policy of growth. Then, politically too, we were doing rather well. We have won war less in Lebanon. We have won agreement more with Egypt. We have an open policy and a welcome change on the West Bank, where terrorism went down by almost 50 percent, where economic development began in the right direction, where today all the mayors are Arabs. A new Jordanian bank was opened there. We have renewed or opened diplomatic relations with many countries in Africa, in Europe. Our relations with the United States are as good as relations can be. Our relations with Great Britain are very close and warm. I believe there is an improvement in the overall position of Israel all over the world. The tension in the country went down. The ethnic tension, even the religious one. I believe there was a real improvement also in the rapport between the Jewish and the Arab citizens of this country. And I don't say we don't have problems. There are still terror, still threat, still shortage. There is still a great deal of work that we have to do. But looking backward, I think we can do with satisfaction. Looking forward, we must keep our alertness, our prayers, and our travail. Really, when I look forward, I'm asking myself what are the major needs of our country. I can summarize it in a few words. More Jews, more peace, more water, more unity, and a little bit of more cultivated land. When all of us, you and us, will attend the synagogue, I believe that we shall turn to the east 
and pray for the freedom of our sisters and brothers in Soviet Russia. They are really struggling for their basic human rights. They are really working to maintain their Jewish identity. I just met in New York with the Foreign Minister of Soviet Russia, Shevardnadze, and I told them that what we are expecting from Russia is what we are expecting as a Jewish people, to have our brothers and sisters back home in accordance with their prayers, conviction, faith, and right. I know it's a long way and it's a hard struggle. I don't have the slightest doubt that we shall win. They will win and we shall be together. Then we shall act and hope and pray for peace. We are sincere on it. I do believe that the ground is prepared more than ever before. Our clear next aim is to arrive to direct and free negotiations with our Arab neighbors. We shall listen to, to them carefully what they have to suggest. Hopefully they will do likewise to our proposals. And even if it will take a long time, let's not forget that the peace momentum is already part of peace itself. When you negotiate, you don't fight. When you hope, you don't threat. And I believe if we shall be wise as we should and strong as we are, we can go ahead. Then, what I meant by water is, we want to maintain our cultivation of the land. The country is rather small, rather dry, so the other week, we have had an exhibition of our agricultural instrumentation and probably we are first in the world in that technology. We have had over 3,000 delegates from 110 countries coming to see what Israel did in the field of irrigation, milk production, computerization of the agricultural methods. It was a real moving event. But we have to have more water and apparently we shall look for ways and means to achieve it either by reclaiming it from the sea or by looking for other sources. And then to go and develop our industry to make Israel among the forerunners in the development of science and technology. We feel very much with you. I'm sure you feel very much with us. Tomorrow night, we shall unite in our prayers. We shall remember. This is a prayer that was repeated year by year, over 4,000 years in human annals, in human history. It was a single voice, a strong voice. We have paid heavily to make our voice loud, to make our faith known, a faith, a faith that always returns to the moral call. We passed through a history with suffering, but we passed it and made our road, remaining true to ourselves, to our tradition, to our language, to our future. And we can look, I do believe, ahead with a great deal of hope and a great deal of work that together we can and should accomplish. Shana Tava. Prime Minister, this is Stephen Roth, Chairman of the Federation. I want to thank you for this message, deeply thoughtful and emotionally stirring at the same time. Thank you. I will not repeat what I said 
in my introduction, which unfortunately you couldn't hear, except to say that I was trying to thank you for your stewardship of the affairs of Israel over two years, which we all admire and for which we are deeply grateful. What I do want to repeat is what I said about the scene here, as you cannot see us, only hear us. We have are assembled here in one of the larger halls of London, an audience of about 500 people, which include leadership and rank and file, older people and youth, includes member of parliament, members of the House of Lords, members of the European Parliament, and of course, His Excellency the Israel Ambassador is with us. I would now like to hand over to one of the honorary vice presidents of our federation, Mr. Leon Kaman, who will introduce the questions which members of the audience would like to address to you. Good evening, Leon. Good evening, Mr. Prime Minister. Good evening. First of all, let me wish you Shana Tova, and through you wish all our brothers and sisters a very happy and prosperous New Year for Israel and for the people all over the world. Thank you. The same to you. Thank you. As uh, the Chairman has said, we've got the leadership and the rank and file. The questions that will be asked will come from people from all walks of life, rather than from the leadership only. And this is the first time that we're giving really the opportunity to everyone, well, as, as time permits, of course, to ask questions. Now, may I call upon Ms. Ruth Willers, a civil servant from Wembley Park, Middlesex. Mr. Prime Minister, you have been a staunch advocate of direct negotiations. What has moved you now to opt for an international peace conference in which Israel will be outnumbered by its opponents? Has the 1973 government decision in favor of such a conference not been superseded by the Camp David Accords? Well, thank you, Ruth, for the question. The problem basically is that when one says an international conference and another says an international conference, I wonder if we are really meaning the very same thing. Nobody is suggesting an international conference which may replace direct negotiation or where the international parties that may participate in this sort of a conference can really have a voice in making a decision. What all of us did agree until now clearly is that an international conference will not serve as a substitute for direct negotiation, but as a support for it. That the international conference cannot impose any solution nor can it cancel any agreement between the parties. That in the wake of the opening of an international conference, the local participants, namely the Arabs and ourselves, will divide themselves into geographic bilateral parties where they will negotiate between themselves and only between themselves without any international participation and that each group will negotiate independently. So this is an altogether different story. Now, frankly, we do not need an international conference, neither does the United States. The one party that is in demand of an international conference is Jordan. We would like to enable the Jordanians to come in and to agree to a sort of an international conference, which on one hand will enable the Jordanians to participate in, and on the other hand, will not make any of the five security members, security council members, 
a party that can have a voice or a vote in this conference. Nobody intends to do so. Then again, as far as we are concerned, we made it very clear that if the Russians want to participate in it, they have to reopen their diplomatic relations with Israel and change their policies toward Russian Jewry. This is the opinion of Israel. This is the opinion of the United States. Now, we are not pressing upon the Russians, neither are we pressed by them. And if they have leverage, we have leverage as well. And you know what? I don't feel nervous at all. And I don't feel I have to repeat anything that happened. I think Israel is strong. We are independent. We can negotiate the peace treaty by ourselves. We don't mind. There will be an international accompanying. And after all, as the Jordanians or the Palestinians cannot make peace without Israel, so Israel cannot make peace without Jordan. And we have to prepare all the necessary conditions for an early negotiation so we shall be able to negotiate without prior conditions. This is our policy. Thank you once again, Prime Minister. I'd like to call upon Mr. Reginald Friesen, Member of Parliament. Mr. Prime Minister, early this year I was in Strasbourg when you appealed through the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly, among other things, for an international development plan, a Marshall Aid program for the Middle East. When do you expect progress to be made on that? What can we do here and in Europe generally to give some strength and force to your proposal? And would it be possible to start at least in a smaller way in tackling the problems of the Palestinian refugees, perhaps in Gaza and in other parts within Israeli administration? The need for the economic aid is today greater than ever before, even, be, even before I spoke before the European Parliament. I think it's a very urgent and important need for the Arab countries. I'm not talking about Israel, our house is more or less in order. On my last visit to the United States a couple of weeks ago, I discussed it with the President and the Secretary of State. I have suggested that the United States several European countries and Japan will form a joint committee so the planning can start immediately. Concerning the West Bank, we have decided not to stop any aid that may come in to the West Bank for constructive purposes and economic development. I do believe that if this sort of a plan, a so-called Marshall Plan, will occur, Maybe the first candidate for it should be the Egyptians, the Jordanians, the West Bankers, and the Gazians. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much once again, Prime Minister. I would like to call upon Mr. Benjamin Gill, a director of the Friends of the Ben Gurion University. Mr. Prime Minister. In two days of Rosh Hashanah, we commence the Ben-Gurion centennial year. As one who has been close to Ben-Gurion, how far do you see his legacy to be relevant to Israel's present problem? Basically, I think his spirit and vision lives within the country and within its own people. Namely, a spirit of a moral conviction and a realistic approach. Many things he has hoped for were realized, yet many other things are awaiting their implementation. If I can say it briefly, we have the Negev, which is still unsettled and empty. This is 50% of the land of Israel. We have to change the situation in the Galilee, 
because the very special situation that prevails there. And the Negev, the scientification, the development of this arid desert was very much in the hearts of Ben-Gurion vision over his last 10 or 20 years of his life. Then again, the second point, I believe, is to bring the Jewish people to Israel, particularly from Soviet Russia. And then, if I may add, a third point which awaits a realization Israel would like very much to become a contributing country, not a country that needs aid, but a country that can aid our countries. So to be, as Ben-Gurion called it, a light unto other nations, all those hopes are with us and we shall do whatever we can to go ahead. I'll now call upon Mr. Harry Cardo, a company director and also the national chairman of uh, Jewish ex servicemens Association. Mr. Prime Minister, are you satisfied with the increasing awareness by the nations of the world of the danger of terrorism and with the anti-terrorist measures various countries have now taken? I'm satisfied with the awareness. I'm not satisfied with the solutions of those awareness. I think that international terror is now being tested by the terrorists as a new dimension to dictate policies or whims or whatever they may have on their mind. Now, if this terroristic dimension will gather strength, it will become a real and even growing danger than today. Whenever we have a problem and you make policy either by peace or war, facing war you have an alliance like NATO. Facing peace you have an organization like the United Nations. Here we have a new phenomena without a proper organized methodical response. I do believe time has come to form an alliance to confront, to reduce, to stop international terror by dealing with all its aspects from the financial end, for example, up to their plans for the future. I do hope very much that considering the great damage international terror has already caused, in the way of human life, of innocent people, or in ways of reducing tourism, I do hope that the free countries and the civilized world will get itself organized beyond an alliance that can face this new dimension of menace. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. You may uh, not know that the press is here. They're quite interested in your answers. Thank you. I would like now to call upon Mr. Johnny Gewirtz, Secretary of the Habonim Youth Movement. Um, actually, my name is Hilary Levy. I'm a representative from the youth movement Habonim Georgia. Not so quick. We are talking on a satellite. A little bit slower. I'm sorry, Mr. Prime Minister. It's perfectly all right. Some two weeks ago, the British television showed a film of some very disturbing excesses and violations of human rights by Israelis in the West Bank. How do you see the Israeli administration of the territory? I can answer very simply violation of the laws or violence as such is strictly forbidden in Israel or by Israel. If there is any sort of a violation of these two rules, it should be brought before the court. And may I assure you that our judicial system, 
which is fair, objective, reliable, won the trust of the Israeli citizens, Arabs and Jews alike, and the respect of the rest of the world, and we shall deal with any violation properly. You've noted the sudden change of sex, Mr. Prime Minister. I hope I'll not make the same mistake Well, I again. can't see. For me, it's completely blind. So I must trust your judgment. Thank you. I would like to call upon Mr. Daniel Moss, law student and executive member of the Tagar Bitar Youth Movement. Mr. Prime Minister, Will the Israeli government under Yitzhak Shamir start again building settlements in Judea and Samaria? No, sir. Why should it be given a priority when the Negev is empty and the Galilee is full? Why should we prefer one part of the country upon another? I think that half of Western Eretz Israel is unsettled and I consider it as the main priority for the future. Prime Minister, this last statement won terrific applause. I think you've heard that. Yes, I did. I would like to call upon a very charming person, Mrs. Brenda Catton, Chairman of the British Widow. Thank you. Mr. Prime Minister, in a rapidly changing and diminishing Jewish world, what, in your opinion, should be the priorities of the Zionist Federation in the interests of Zionism and the State of Israel today. What is your message to us, and in particular, your message to the Zionist youth at this, the beginning of the membership campaign? Well, it's a very provocative question, and my answer will be in one word, Aliyah, come and live here. That's the meaning of Zionism. But, short of that, I would say Jewish education, visit to Israel, studying the Bibles, the Bible should be the next call after coming to Israel. Thank you. Thank you. I would now like to call upon Rabbi Charles Emmanuel Minister of the Aliyah Garden, I'm uh, sorry, Alif Garden Synagogue in Golders Green. Talking of Aliyah, Prime Minister, I said <laughs> Aliyah instead of Alif. Mr. Prime Minister, you have recently stated that Israel is doing for the 3,000 Jews of Syria the same as it is doing for Soviet Jews, both publicly and quietly. As this is not the general impression, I would appreciate it if you would elaborate on the action for Syrian Jews. I would rather not. I said quietly and not loudly, because when you are loud, nobody will listen to you in Syria, and it won't help the Jewish community there. So I wouldn't go into any details. Sorry and thank you. I particularly appreciate your reply, Mr. Prime Minister, in that respect. I have missed out Mr. Mervyn Elliott, semi-retired advertising executive and the leader of the reform movement. Mr. Prime Minister, the government of national unity had a unique opportunity to reform Israel's electoral laws to limit the influence of extreme fundamentalist groups. Why was this not done? Basically, the two parties have promised their electorate that once they will win whatever they may during the elections, they will support an electoral change. The party which I represent 
has introduced a law just a few weeks ago in the parliament for this reform in our electoral system. But we won 50 seats out of 90 members who were present, which is not a sufficient majority. You have to have a privileged majority for this sort of a vote. Some members of the Likud have voted with us, but the Likud as a party has promised apparently to their partners, their satellites, the smaller parties, not to change the system. And this is the reason why we have failed in the last vote. So we are continue to struggle for it because I think it's a real needed serious change in the political system of Israel. I would like to call upon Mr. Mervyn Kirsch, editor of the Jewish Herald and the Herut Journal, the Zionist Standard. Shalom, Prime Minister. Prime Minister. Shalom. The, the Egyptian government has so far shown a lack of regard for the terms of the Camp David Accords. What reason have you to hope that your recent meeting in Alexandria will produce a more concrete approach into a true spirit of peace? Well, the Camp David Accord had two parts. One concerning Egypt and Israel. This, war, this was more or less implemented. The other part is in relation to the Palestinian people. Nothing out of it made any progress. Before I went to Alexandria, I have felt that there is a danger that the peace agreement between Egypt and ourselves is on a dying uh, position. And I do believe that our meeting in Alexandria saved the peace, saved the hope for peace, saved the strategy for peace. We have told the Egyptians that we sincerely and seriously would like to achieve a comprehensive peace settlement in the Middle East. And we are looking for ways and means how to do so. But you know, peace, even when you sign it, must be cultivated and maintained. Otherwise, it may disappear and pass away. So I'm very glad that the peace relations, the peace accord between Egypt and ourselves is holding on for the last few years. But we have to assure it for years to come and to extend it to our countries and, our, and other people as well. Thank you. And I would now like to call upon Mr. Freddy Gross, retired journalist and long-time Labour Zionist. Mr. Prime Minister, after your government has successfully conquered inflation, can you see a way that it should cure the basic problems of Israel's economy, such as low productivity and the high foreign debt? The answer is yes. <laughs> Very straightforward answer. Thank you. I would like now to call upon Mr. Bernard Davis, an accountant and vice chairman of Pro Zion, a progressive Zionist group. Mr. Prime Minister, does the Labour Party recognize the right of the reform movement? to coexist with the orthodox establishment on equal terms? And would you favor the establishment of a party to represent the reform movement in the Knesset? Aren't you compli complicating my life a little bit by this very complicated question? But let me say clearly, we are for permitting all religious stream, streams in Jewish life to coexist in respect and equality. And the Labour Party is supportive of it very much. When it comes to the introduction of laws, we have to go step by step, because by trying to
to achieve the utmost, we may break the back of unity of our people. And I'm not just speaking in relation to the demands of the reform synagogue, but also in the relations to the demands of other synagogues. One of the expressions I like very much is the one that was suggested by the famous Jewish author Arthur Miller when he has said that Judaism is made of so many variations that it is almost un-Jewish to marry one of them. We have to live together in spite of our variations. Thank you. And now, Mr. Alex Coleman, retired company director and chairman of Hackney Anglo-Israel Friendship Association. Mr. Prime Minister, during your term of office, you had the cooperation and the genuine support of Yitzhak Shamir by quelling his supporters' criticism and thus avoiding a government rift. Can we and the electorate of Israel hope that you will likewise support Mr. Shamir's task during his term of office for the sake of unity, effective government, and a safe Israel? Well, I wouldn't like to argue with your different descriptions or demands or suggestions, but may I say that a government is not based upon mutual favors. It is based upon cooperation. It is basically based upon an agreed policy. And as the government, under my leadership, has followed the agreed policy, I'm sure that Mr. Shamir will do likewise, and the government will be as successful. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Dr. Maurice Erskine, medical practitioner, of Greenford, Middlesex. Mr. Prime Minister, how do you see the relations between Britain and Israel at present, particularly as this country has now the chairmanship of the EEC? We have had a visit of Mrs. Thatcher to our country. I believe she charmed the hearts of many Israelis and also established a precedent because this was for the first time that a prime minister, a British prime minister, while in office, visited officially the state of Israel. We have appreciated very much. I'm correspond corresponding with Mrs. Thatcher and by most, on most of the issues, I think we understand each other, we have an agreement. I think our commerce goes well, our memories are full of thank you, occasionally with some polemics, but by and large I would describe the relations between Great Britain and Israel as cultured, warm, deep, and I hope it will be improved even more in the future. I would like now to call upon Mr. Michael Catton, architect and graduate of a student scheme in Israel. Mr. Prime Minister, as a young single person making Aliyah alone next week, I am most concerned about the travel tax law which makes it difficult for Olim to keep in touch with their families abroad. What are the chances of the travel tax being abolished in the near future or at least for there being some sort of exemption for new Olim? Are you talking... Uh, you're talking about this year travel tax or the other year travel tax? Because this year, this year is not very high, and as a matter of fact, that if I'm not wrong, over 700,000 Israelis traveled abroad this year, and I do not believe that we have 700,000 millionaires. 
I think an average Israeli, whether it's an Ole or not, can make today the travel if necessary. But I do hope that the next year we shall be able even more to reduce the cost of the price or the tax which is laid on travel abroad. But we did cut it, as you know, quite seriously, and we shall continue to do so in the future. I would like to call upon Ms. Pamela Manson. A little bit louder, please. I can hardly hear. Regarding the mini summit, Natam Sharansky says support for Soviet Jews is not only a human rights issue, but related to international Western security. Will you be lobbying President Reagan to request Mr. Gorbachev to address himself to the reunification of thousands of divided or refused Nick families in accordance with the Helsinki Agreement on Human Rights, which the Soviets signed? Yes. I did it already when I just met President Reagan and May I tell you, madam, that he spoke very movingly on that subject. I found both the President and the Secretary of State, George Schultz, deeply involved. May I tell you a small story? Last year, before Secretary Schultz was flying to Moscow, he approached me in my hotel and he says, Shimon, can I ask your advice? I have a hidden dream. And my hidden dream is to ask Gorbachev personally that he will permit me to take back from Soviet Russia Mr. Sharansky and Ida Nudel. I want to take them on my plane and bring them to Israel. You know, I was really moved. Here is a Secretary of State, not necessarily Jewish, that has on his agenda many demanding issues, yet he considers this of it, this one, from a human point of view, from an American point of view, from an Israeli point of view, of the utmost importance. President Reagan told me in our private conversation that he intends to raise the issue of human rights, of Soviet Jewry, in his forthcoming summit meeting, and they don't have the slightest doubt that the president will do so. And now, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, our chairman wants to ask a question. Mr. Prime Minister, in a few days' time, you will give up according to the rotation agreement, the office of prime minister and will assume that of foreign minister. What will be your priorities as a minister of foreign affairs? To make peace, to keep the connection with Jewish life and represent Jewish interest all the world over. Thank you. My chairman here is prompting me to ask a question, but I know the answer myself. But uh, so I'll ask start you with the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Do you believe the government of national unity will complete its period of office? I am experienced enough in politics not to make any forecasts, but this is my hope. I thought that would be the answer. You see? Uh, perhaps this is a personal question, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, as you may have noticed, I, a Sephardi, being also a leader of the Zionist Federation, and I do not consider that there is any difference between Ashkenazi and Sephardi. Why should you? 
I've recently given up my office in the World Safari Federation as treasurer and resigned from the Presidium. It's my intention to lead a movement to unite the people of Israel as just one people. Do I have your blessing, Mr. Prime Minister? I'm convinced the time has come for all of us to stop being Sfaradim or Ashkenazim and start being one Jewish people. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. I Thank you for your blessing, and uh, I think that goal will soon be achieved, and I will not sleep until I've achieved it. I'd like to call upon uh, a veteran here, one of our leaders, Russell Chin. Prime Minister, the Zionist Federation in its early days was really the strength of the Jewish people. What importance do you place on the Zionist Federation and its strength today? Well, it sounds like a commercial almost. But may I say, I may I say that today as yesterday, the Zionist movement is of great importance. The strength of Jewish people, of the union of Jewish people, and making Israel a center of their activities adds meaning and momentum to this historic movement. And I hope, Mr. Chin, that you, like your very able son, and the generations to come will continue with the same dynamism and devotion to act for your people and our country. Before I hand over to the Chairman and uh, David Jacobs, I would like you, Prime Minister, to thank my boys in the studios. The transmission is excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, regretfully, Mr. Prime Minister, we have come to the end of the satellite time, and the link will soon be broken. But it's only the technological link. I want to assure you that the link between us in our common endeavors, the bond between diaspora and Israel is unbreakable and it has been certainly further strengthened by tonight's proceedings. Once again, Mr. Prime Minister, I would like to express thanks on behalf of all those present here and uh, we would like to convey to you and through you to the people of Israel our best wishes for Shana Tova and mainly for Shnat Shalom. And thank you again for having agreed to give us this stirring message and this wealth of information which were packed in this one memorable hour. Prime Minister. Thank you very much. Let us pray together for a year of happiness and peace to ourselves, to the Jewish people all over the places, to our neighbors. Shana Tova, Jerusalem. Yes. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please don't leave because uh, although the transmission via the satellite has ended, our proceedings in this hall have not actually finished. I'd now like to introduce you, although you met him but a moment ago putting one of the final questions to the Prime Minister, to the President of the Honorary President of the Zionist Federation, Mr. Rossa Chip. Capital Studios from London. Thank you. Just to say uh, good night, and thank you very much indeed for your help. I'm sorry about the four, what, the uh, clean feed, but it was just the sound being picked up on the microphones from the loudspeakers in the presentation hall. Okay, could you confirm the um, Prime Minister was wearing an earpiece, was he? Yes, it was just that we couldn't see it, and we were taking bets whether or not he was. Excellent makeup. Thank you very much indeed. Good night to you.